fellow humanists, my name is Todd Kimball. It's an honor to be with you this morning. I welcome those of you live in the Keystone Room at the Friendly House in Northwest Portland. I also welcome you those on Zoom joining us primarily from the Portland metro area, but also from around the world. It's an honor to be with you this morning. We have a dynamic reader. We have a dynamic presenter. It's going to be a fun hour and a half. I will keep my remarks to a minimum and we will get right to it. I will remind you that humanism is a rational philosophy informed by science, inspired by art and motivated by compassion. It advocates the extension of participatory democracy and the expansion of an open society standing for human rights and social justice. Joining us for the reading this morning, live and in person in three dimensional form is the lovely and talented Ann Henderson. Yay! Thank you very much, thank you very much. Um, I came across this uh, from a friend of mine, Corf, you know, uh, sent me something on Facebook and uh, and it's from Judy Dench. I think she wrote it, but it might, but anyway, I, I'm attributing it to her. Don't prioritize your looks, my friend, as they won't last the journey. Your sense of humor, though, will only get better with age. Your intuition will grow and expand like a, mus like a majestic cloak of wisdom. Your ability to choose your battles will be fine-tuned to perfection. Your capacity for stillness for living in the moment will blossom. Your desire to live each and every moment will transcend any other wants. Your instinct for knowing what and who is worth your time will grow and flourish like ivy on a castle wall. Don't prioritize your looks, my friend. They will change forevermore. That pursuit is one of much sadness and disappointment. Prioritize the uniqueness that makes you, you, and the invisible magnet that draws in other like-minded souls to dance in your orbit. Though these are the things which will only get better. Thank you, Anne. Excellent words to live by. Religious beliefs appeared very late in evolutionary history. They are apparently confined to humans and our recent ancestors. Religious beliefs leave few traces in the fossil, re fossil record, but we have ways of inferring their origins and potential benefits. Dr. Gordon Oriens, an evolutionary biologist and frequent presenter at HGP, will take us on an informative and engaging journey this morning. Let's have a rousing ovation from our friendly house audience and a warm yet muted welcome from our Zoom audience for Dr. Gordon Oriens. Thank you. After that warm welcome, <clears throat> I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. It's, <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be here. I've gotten to know many of you on Zoom as I've done programs before. And I just decided it was about time to actually meet some of you. Zoom is better than nothing, but meeting is so much better than Zoom. So I offered to come down and give a talk here, and I've been enjoying meeting with you uh, last night informally and this morning, and uh, sharing some thoughts with you that you may find of, of interest. So it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm really enjoying seeing your faces, your real things, rather than just, oh yeah, I know you on Zoom. But, uh, I have a mixed love-hate relationship with Zoom, I think, as most of you do. <clears throat> but let me tell you a wee bit about myself and how I came to consider what my talk is today, the evolution of religious beliefs. I'm a preacher's kid, and I grew up in Wisconsin, and I had a very close relationship with my father, um, who was a very, very wonderful man, he was not a biblical literalist, but he, he was serious about his, his charge, but he believed that these biblical stories were metaphors. They were important metaphors. They had messages for us. We should pay attention to them. But the, he didn't believe the Bible was a history book. It was a book about how to lead the good life. 
and we should take them seriously. So he had no trouble with evolution and all of that. So I didn't have to do a big break as I slowly uh, uh, became a, an evolutionary biologist and sort of subtracted from God's portfolio uh, gradually until God didn't have much left. Um, I didn't have to go through any wrenching experience with my father. And I think he maybe hoped I would stay more in the fold, but he understood and I never had to fight with him. So it was easy. So, uh, but, but I, I'm the kind of guy that you don't give up something for nothing. And I had a very <laughs> complete, for me, a view of the world and where we were and where we came from, what it was all about. And as I was abandoning that, I, I don't abandon it for nothing. I had to find a replacement. So I spent a lot of time in my life and culminating what I'm going to talk about this morning of providing for myself a complete and, and a rational understanding of, of the world, where we came from, what we're all about, that didn't include uh, the religious beliefs that I had uh, grown, grown up with. So much of my life has been part of that process. And at first, um, I got very much interested. Well, I became a Darwinist, and I did evolutionary ecology. Uh, I'm much more interested in how things came to be and, and what what is the real nature of the world that Darwin led us into? And most people, even the scientists who believe that Darwin was right, have no idea of what Darwin really said. Um, and and uh, Darwin didn't cre uh, convince people that there was evolution. Uh, he didn't talk about the origin of species, despite the, the name of the book. And he, he didn't, the book isn't about natural selection because he didn't have any example in the book. Otherwise, the book is per perfectly titled, and and the title of the book is part of uh, part of the confusion uh, that that emerged. What Darwin did is said, and and this was an, an amazing idea throughout Western history. If there's if there's design out there in nature, which there is, there has to be a designer, and. Uh, I was always a designer in all cultures, and in the Western culture, it was uh, the Judaic God was the obvious designer. Uh, and what Darwin's dangerous, really radical idea is that I can give you design without a designer. And here's the mechanism that that I'm proposing. Uh, and this up upends Western causes of ca causality. Because there's design, there's a designer. And all of a sudden, Darwin says, no, you don't need a designer. There's nobody in charge out there. And it's even a, an amazingly radical idea. It's DNA copying errors. Really? You're going you're gonna to take that as the basis for what's going on? But that's, that's what it is. It's DNA copying. So mistakes a few of which turn out to be useful, most of which don't. So this is the, this is the fundamentally radical thing uh, that we're talking about, and I came to embrace. But then I, I had to find this alternative, uh, search for who we are, where we came from, the answers to all those big questions that religion uh, typically provided. And I started out a lot working on the the main problems that organisms have to solve uh, to, to be successful. You, you have to find food. You have to avoid being food for somebody else. You got to find a place to live. Just, there's a few basic things. Um, and I, after a while, and I worked with blackbirds for that, and I know more than it's rational to know about red-winged blackbirds. So don't ask me about them unless you have a lot of time on your hands. But um, I... I then thought, I, I'd worked on foraging, behavior, and all this sort of stuff. And it occurred to me, well, our ancestors faced the same problems. Uh, could I use some of the techniques I had developed to study behavioral ecology of birds effectively to our ancestors? So I decided to give it a try. And my first trip to East Africa was designed to answer one question. If I have lived back then, where in that mosaic of habitats would I have wanted to be? 
and I came back with an answer to that. And I use that, that as a basis for thinking about a lot of our reactions to environment, why we find some trees prettier than others, why we care about flowers, why we're musical, et cetera. And I eventually encoded all of that in a book of mine called Snakes, Sunrises, and Shakespeare, How Evolution Shapes Our Loves and Fears. And that was my big approach into uh, the Darwinian world as applied to us. And I thought this was very rewarding, but I never looked back further into why, where does religion come from in the first place? As we look at overall history of Earth, there was no religion anywhere. And as far as we can tell, our immediate ancestors are the only place that what we would call religious beliefs ever evolved. Nobody else, no, no other primates seemed to have it at all. How come it took so long? How come only us and nobody else? And so I went into a search to try to answer those questions. And my little personal odyssey on that question is what I'm going to share with you this morning. So I'm going to go way back and I'm going to try to build a picture of what were the things that had to happen in order for this to come about. And, and then my, my explanation, which is entirely, not entirely original, is to why, why us and why only us? And the answer, I think, is a surprising one. At least it was surprising to me. And, and then looking how it built out, and finally we end up uh, into complicated, or in some ways very simple, monotheistic mono, mono religions where uh, God has a, an absolutely enormous portfolio and is charge of everything, whereas replacing uh, history of, of lots of gods that had smaller portfolios and so that's that's the journey that I want to share with you. So let's go back. For most of life on Earth, there was obviously nothing. There was there was there was no parental care. Uh, organisms just cast their gametes out into the environment, and all all of selection was chemical. It was either the right thing or not, and you bond it. And we still see that in the majority of organisms. And take plants for example. The 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 pollen goes out into the air, and there's very com com <clears throat> excuse me, very complex chemical discrimination in the pollen landing on the stigma. And plants do a lot of selection. They're, not everybody gets privileged to go down the style to the ovary, but it's all chemical. There's no individual recognition. There's species recognition. There may be some sub some species that variability. So all of this was was basically chemical. And it still happens, <clears throat> thank you, still happens in a lot of organisms. Um, and even one really, what I find an outstanding case in birds, mostly birds, as we'll see, they know who they are, they know who their mom and dad are. But there's a wonderful group of birds called the megapodes or mound builders. And they're found in Australia and then across the islands and as far as the Indian Ocean Island. And how they breed is they get together a big pile of rotting stuff and put the eggs in there. And it's the heat of decomposition that, that nurtures the eggs. And the parents come back and they'll stick a bill in and open up a little bit or close up a little bit, get the right, right temperature. And then when the young megapode hacks out, it never sees its parents. As an idea, it hops out, hops off, and goes out into the world. <clears throat> How does it know it's a megapode? Well, it's got to be chemical, doesn't it? And it, you got some sense of the chemical of the adults that put it in. And if you meet somebody, it smells right. And that's what's what you know. And that's that's the one case, even in birds, where it's still chemical. There's no, and which I find just absolutely fascinating. But there's other stuff. Uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't know how I look if I didn't have mirrors. How, how, how do things know? How, how does an elephant know that it's an elephant? How does it know what an elephant looks like? Uh, there's a lot of really interesting questions of how we know, but uh, I won't get into that uh, unless you really want to further. What happened? All this chemistry and marvelous stuff that works and most of the organisms still use it. What happened to change? And it, it was parental care. 
The important thing that evolved next <clears throat> that made things different was parental care. Because what happens with parental care, you, re you can produce lots of gametes and throw stuff out. You can only take care of a small number. So what happens with the evolution of parental care, it's the evolution of slower and slower reproductive rates. Because you can only take care of a few. But what this means, you get in the social groups, you get down to a small enough number that you can effectively recognize and react to individuals. And this is a very, very important thing. And we've known this <clears throat> for some time. You know, chickens develop a pecking order. That means they know every other chicken in the group and they know its rank. And they know I can peck you and I can't peck you. But that involves, they have to recognize every individual and know that individual as an individual. Uh, we now know in, in most vertebrate societies where reproductive rates are low, inevitably because there is parental care, you, you have a small enough individuals you can actually recognize individuals. Um, and that's true of most uh, organisms then with, with parental care. This made possible something really important, individual recognition. You can react differently to different individuals. You know your relationships, you can develop this. And in any social organization, the most important thing that determines your fit, fitness and success is how you get along with other individuals, uh, your relationships, your, your alliances, you know who you can't deal with, et cetera. So uh, individual, recogni individual recognition is absolutely essential in developing the kind of stuff we're talking about. And, and the, the, the most, and, and it, in some cases, there still remains like social insects where there is elaborate parental care. The group is so big, there's no possibility of individual recognition. And you're either a member of the group or you aren't. That's the only discrimination that's made. If you're not a member of the group, you get attacked and killed if you try to show up. And if you are a member of the group, you're let in. But so that's the only recognition there is. But in most of, of the vertebrates in which we do have parental care, which includes a lot of them, the, the number of offspring is small, the number of individuals you have to get to know is manageable. So we have parental care, uh, a lot lowering, lowering reproductive rates, making individual identifications and recognition of individuals very important. And so, uh, this, this sets the stage for the, the next stage of the, the development of, 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 of a huge brain. And we know that what happened in the, in the East African savannas, there was a period of time when our brains tripled in size uh, and we became what is modern human. And uh, we developed the, the neural computing capacity to do a lot of the, uh, the interesting and strange things we do today with this amazing brain. So, but it was it was taking place there in the savanna, and um, and but other things, chimps were there, you know, gorillas around, all the other primates. None of them went on further to take that that next step in evolving a big brain. So our brain tripled in size, and it's one of the fastest bits of evolution going on, and it was truly am amazing. So what? enabled us and nobody else to get this big, big brain. Well, the first thing to recognize about big brains is they consume vast amounts of energy. Brains are really expensive. This three pound thing I've got up there takes about a quarter of my daily metabolic energy. It's really, brains are really, really costly. And what enabled us and nobody else to support the evolution of a big brain? And I think the answer is cooking. Cooking. This is not my original idea. Richard Wrangham, who is an anthropologist at Harvard, who studied chimps and everything, has written a wonderful book, which I highly recommend to you. It's called Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human. So what does cooking do? First thing cooking does is vastly expands the range of things you can eat, because this humanity runs today on the the seeds of three annual grasses: rice, wheat, wheat, and corn. None of which you can eat raw. 
you got to cook it, okay? Uh, and even um, meat, which is pretty nice, if you don't if you don't think the importance of cooking, uh, go to some Creole market and buy a chicken. Try to eat it raw. I mean, don't try it, okay? <laughs> but you you get you get the point. I mean, uh, cooking uh, vastly expands what you. And the other thing that it does, it it outsources a, quite a bit of the digestion to the fire. So what when you sit down to dinner. You you have a pre-digested meal. A lot of the, a lot of the, the digestion has already taken place. We've outsourced it to the fire. This means that we can take. We've got a lot of energy that you can support a big brain because you're not having to devote all that energy to, to breaking down the food and digesting it. So fire is an incredible thing, uh, and. And as Richard Rangan points out, it's changed everything. It's 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 changed the whole structure of our head. We don't have those big powerful jaws anymore. Well, we don't. Fire takes care of it, doesn't it? We cook it. We don't have to do. It. We talk about a tough nut to crack. Well, we don't have to crack tough nuts anymore. We uh, we we can do this. Uh, and so, uh, cooking enables as it's changed our guts. Uh, look look. At the, uh, our primate relatives of the old, they got great big paunches, right? Chimps spend six hours a day chewing, according to Richard Wrangham. This is, you know, we don't spend much time chewing. Uh, we've outsourced it to the fire. So cooking has done a, a, an absolutely amazing thing. And I'm convinced that Richard Wrangham is right. That is cooking, that we, we figured out how to tame fire and cook. Nobody else did. And that's how we, we and we alone, the God, have get this these super expensive big brains, and these then big brains with all this computing power uh, start skinning uh, an organism that will start asking a lot of questions that nobody else asks. Uh, and the, I mean, uh, dogs are wonderful, love dogs, but dogs don't seem to be the least, least bit worried about dying or have any concept of what death is, and. Uh, that's probably to their advantage, but that's another matter. But you know, uh, the big brain then starts us to be talking, uh, thinking about all sorts of stuff that don't seem to occur to organisms that don't have such big brains with such great computing power. So, so I think cooking has set the stage, and then several things happened in relation to that that I think are important in the in the final stages. One, and this is universal in, in human societies, you get to, uh, assuming that there are agents out in the world that are taking care of things. It, it's, it's what uh, philosopher Daniel Dennett calls the intentionality stance. That, that you assume there's intentionality out there, that, that the the, the entities that are somehow running the world, and the world seems to be running, and somebody must be in charge, that they have intentionality. And this could be very advantageous in a number of ways to think that way. Suppose I'm going out hunting, and I ask, if I were a rabbit, where would I hide to avoid being caught? This is probably going to make me a better rabbit hunter, okay? But it does, that doesn't depend upon the rabbit have any such ideas at all. Well, the rabbit may, I, I doubt that the rabbit is actually thinking that, but it works because rabbits have been molded by natural selection to take evasive actions. And so we're tapping into natural selection by assuming the intentional stance. We, so, but then we assume intentionality to everything. And if you look at the, sort of the history of human thinking, it's there's in, intentional agents are running everything. Um, and uh, the wonderful thing about having intentional agents, it gives you some opportunity. Maybe you can cut deals. If there's somebody really doing something out there, you can maybe cut a deal. If there's, if there's no, no thing with any intentionality, there's, you, you can't cut any deals. So a lot of what then developed and has led to the development of religious ideas is that somehow we can cut deals with who's ever in charge. 
And one of the most important and most interesting of these is the winter solstice ceremonies that came all across the Northern hemisphere. You know, the days are getting shorter, this is colder, and maybe who's ever running the show, maybe we'll decide not to come back this year. Well, we don't want that to happen. So let's have a ceremony and, and plead, please turn around and come back again. So you have all these winter solstice ceremonies and they're very elaborate. They know exactly where the sun is gonna rise that morning and cast a shadow. And you have stone hands, which is wonderful, but they're all over the place like that. Well, so the ceremony is, well, if he's the gods say, we will know who we care, please, please come turn around. And of course, this is the most successful religious ceremony ever concocted, 100% success. <laughs> and, <clears throat> okay, I'm a, I'm a young upstart scientific kind of guy living in Stonehenge. And I notice we don't have any controls. We've, we've never done anything. Uh, we don't know whether this ceremony is really doing it. So, hey, let's, let's try it. Let's not do the ceremony this year. I don't think you would have great expectations of my success. You know, I mean, you couldn't, <clears throat> you simply couldn't afford not to do it. Um, and it would, I would not have been a, 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 in an adv advantageous position I'd rec I'd recommended to the group. Let's, let's not do it this year. So these can have very powerful things. So you can cut deals. And of course, as we'll see as we explore more about religious beliefs, a lot of it is involves cutting deals. And, but if you don't have an intentional agent, and, and now we, we, those days it was every, everything that was in all the physical environment, volcanoes and storms and all of that, they were all run by an intentional agent. And we gradually, uh, over in most of Western society, stop thinking that phys the physical things, vol volcanoes don't have intentions. There's no great message from God when a volcano goes off. You know? And that got abandoned first, but it's in the adaptation of the living world where, they, but at first everything had intentionality. And it was a very important thing to, to believe that there was intentionality, even when there wasn't. So I, my, my argument is that the intentional stance which is something you can, you have to have the big brain to figure that out, you know, to assume that. It, it, takes, it takes a big computer up there that can calculate and think a lot of stuff to develop the idea of intentionality out there. So, but I think it was a, a very important thing, even though it, intentionality was applied to all sorts of things that didn't have any intentionality. And uh, as we go along into the world of Darwin, there's less and less intentionality out there. And, and it's, hard to, it's hard to believe. So uh, the intentional stance and the assumption of intentionality, which is a byproduct of the big brain, I think was a very important thing in the development of, of our thinking and how we go. Um, the next thing, which I think has, was really important in this whole process was the development of shamans and shamanism. This is very widespread in uh, various cultures. And this is the first time that you set aside somebody special that goes through special training and becomes the person that you can appeal to uh, for help in, in doing the things that are, are dangerous out there. And the, sh the shamans were probably very good ethnobotanists. They probably knew an awful lot. Uh, and and what you then were developing with the shamanism, death delay, the, the delay of death, and I'm going to argue the, the procedure that comes next is the denial of death. But we start with the delay, and the shamanism definitely delayed death, um, and 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 they were they probably did an awful lot of good uh, because they they were probably the closest thing that. Uh, we had to, to scientists way back then. Because they, and they <clears throat> embedded in a lot of ritual and, and you, you went into stand, uh, trances and stuff like that um, and, and made it seem really important. But there was probably a lot, and there's probably some placebo in there too, which we still have a lot of. But I, I think the development of shamanism was very important. But this is the first time 
you set aside somebody to be the, the agent that helps you get to what is the eventual goal is the denial of death. Okay, so I think fear of death is a, a major, major driver in, in the evolution of the, we got one of the things when we really got smart is that you started to worry about what this thing is death. Uh, as far as we know, no other animal has any idea what death is or that they worry about it. Um, it, it the, I don't think my dog is at least bit interested in or has any concept of what death is and thinks, thinks it all about it. We do. Uh, and I think, again, this is a byproduct of the big brain that you start thinking about and asking those questions. So the shaman is very important in, in the delay of death. And then the further development of religion, I think, was uh, driven primarily by the fear of death. And you can see all the rituals that are going on are to of help avoid death. Uh, and some of the most, take the Egyptian pyramids. Okay, those, the, those are designed, those are death denial structures. You're gonna go somewhere. The Egyptian concept of the, of the, the, the promised land uh, was not full service because uh, you had to take a lot of stuff with you. So if you, you look at what they do, they're, you had to take an awful lot of stuff with you to, to get there, uh, which of course made it ripe for pilfering and everything else because a lot of stuff was put there uh, that was, was valuable. It's amazing what, what they stuck into those pyramids, but you were going to need help there. But it was to go, it was death denial, but you, you, needed, you needed a lot of help because it wasn't full service out there. The what evolved as as the uh, the, the more Judeo Christian single service, it was it was full service. You didn't have to take anything, uh, but you dealt with you had all these bodies, and, and the bodies weren't going anywhere. They were dying. You had to deal with the bodies. But if you're going to have this denial of of death, uh, something has to go, and then the soul got invented. The soul was a necessary invention in this process because that's something that could go. But the body wasn't it was obviously, even though the body of Jesus was supposed to have gone somewhere in belief. Uh, obviously, the other bodies were they could see you know they were not dumb. All the other bodies they had to do things with them. They weren't going anywhere, but there had to be something that was going somewhere, and that was that was what I think the concept of the soul got invented. And uh, a lot of the stuff is invented. It's not in the Bible at all. None of this stuff was in the Bible. This is all stuff that was in all purgatory and everything. Was all, all of the stuff of the Catholic Church was increasing, uh, telling you, okay, it's harder and harder to get there. You're going to need a lot more help, and, and we're the ones that can do it. And, and the great the cathedrals of, of Western Europe. Those are, those are the pathway to eternal life. That's how you get there. And they're magnificent. I remember I'm a kid from Wisconsin and I've never, uh, my idea of a good building would have wall-to-wall -wall flooring and the roof didn't leak. And I, I got a full by fellow, I went to England and the first week they took us out to Canterbury the Cathedral and I about died. I had no idea that a building could do that to you. And I, I just had to sit down. I was just overwhelmed. And they are, they are unbelievably overwhelming. But those, the, those are the buildings through which you get to eternal life, death, death, denial. But a lot of what the Catholic theology is inventing is more and more elaborate ways why you're going to need more help. But if you look at what Jesus is reported to have said, which we don't really know because it was all written down long after he was dead by people who never met him, but he never talked about, as, as reported, never talked about intermediaries, you know, that you had, to, you had to go through some elaborate help to get there. It was, and the, in Quaker meetings, you still have that, the, the idea that you don't need anybody else. You can just talk. Um, and so the, the Quaker societies, you have that, and but 
it doesn't catch on. Uh, the Quaker view of the talk directly just doesn't grab people. It's been around for a long time. A few people do it. Uh, somehow we want real ritual. We want a lot of fun stuff attached to this, something that is important to that is just, oh, talk to God, you know, which is the sort of the kind of Quaker thing. It doesn't catch on. It's just been a tiny view. No, nobody has really um, done much of anything with it. You know, it just stays there. A few people do it, and it'll, it'll probably never be more than a, an occasional odd sort of thing. So uh, increasing, I, I think, the final stages in the evolution of religious belief is a fear of death. Uh, and what religion seemed to offer then was an opportunity to avoid death. You're going to have eternal life. Uh, you're going you're going to, but you've got to have help. You can't do it on your own. And um, there's rot and the government and only I can help you, right? Sounds familiar, okay. <laughs> um, that this, we still buy that, okay. You know that's 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 the message. If things are really bad. There's only one one way you can get it solved, and, and I'm it. And uh, that's basically the, the 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 church message too. There's uh, you, you got to need help. That there's opportunity for for life eternal, but uh, you can't do it without help. I'm the I'm the guy that can help you, and it gets more and more elaborate as to what it needs you got to do to get me to help you. And so, in many <clears throat> in many ways, the evolution of of the Catholic Church theology, all of which is invented, none of which is in the Bible. Even whatever you think about the Bible and what what it represents, none of that's there. Uh, and Jesus didn't talk; isn't reputed to talk. So all of this is more and more complicated, but it's still uh, b building on the fear of death. Uh, and okay, we got a solution. Uh, we can give you eternal life, but we, we require a lot of help. You got to do some stuff with us. You know, got to give us some alms and, and indulgences and all the things that have been invented. That uh, with that we can help you get there. Uh, and that's not to say that a lot of people go to church today are going only for fear of death. What I'm, what I'm claiming is that's what drove it. And people may no longer be quite as afraid of dying as they were, but they go for the ritual and they like this or that. But what I'm, what I'm arguing is that probably historically, that's what drove the process that was afraid of death and, and not knowing what, what death is and something somehow wanting to avoid it. Um, and I've always really, really found it peculiar that those of us that think uh, you can't take it with you and besides you're not going anywhere, uh, uh, don't seem to be much worried about death, but the people who think you're going to go for eternal bliss and want to keep these vegetables alive, and if, if you're going to go up there, why delay? I mean, what's what's the point of keeping this semi vegetable alive when you could have eternal bliss tomorrow? Uh, and I, I just find this totally totally puzzling. I can't figure that one out. <clears throat> why would you delay? Why would you delay if this is what you think is coming? Maybe you have an explanation you can offer to me. I, I I've thought about it many times, and I'm. I end up being totally baffled. So anyway, I've not painted a picture. What I think how things happened. It began with parental care, which got groups small enough you could recognize and deal with individuals. Uh, it, it, it got with, with, with cooking, surprising element that does amazing things and not only changed what we eat, but it enabled us to support this huge brain, which is extraordinarily expensive. And nobody else invented cooking. Nobody else figured out a way to support 
there are always mutations for bigger brains than all these other organisms. They never paid off. You couldn't support them. And it's cooking that enabled us to support them. Then we got this big, big brain that starts doing all sorts of things. Um, and then it, it, it starts developing notions of the intentionality in the universe and the importance of the intentional stance, which then leads to regarding everything having intentionality. And gradually what, what has happened is we've reduced the amount of intentionality out there. But the intentionality stance was really important. <laughs> and then finally, what I think is the last thing, is going from death delayed until death denied. I think that's the final step that got us to where we are. So that's my view. How it is that us only, uh, why it happened so late and what were the precursors? That may not be correct, but meanwhile, enjoy your next partly pre-digested meal. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Orians, I love this talk today. Um, very insightful. You took us on a, a good journey of humanity and uh, evolution and the evolution of thoughts. Uh, Dr. Orians, I'll start with the first question. I, I like this the third concept that you put forth about death delay and death denial. And it seems like uh, that's one of the things that science does. And there's a large percentage of people that they try and delay death in different ways. I mean, exercise, eating right, you know, not only leads to a good quality of life, but it also hopefully delays death. But we also have other technologies like cloning or cryogenics that seem like another form of death denial. Uh, how do you look at these new technologies and how they fit into your presentation today? Well, I think all these new technologies are part of what I talked about. We still don't want to die. You know, we, we, we still like the idea that, and, uh, and I, I, I know I feel that way. I mean, I'm calm, I'm calm about dying. I've outlived everybody, you know, and I, I'm okay with it, but I'm still having fun, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so we all, the fountain of youth, we, 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 use, we use medicine, we want to get frozen files, so maybe 10,000 years later we can come back. We're still, and medicine is, uh, uh, in some ways, medicine still offers death denial. We're, we're, we're going to stop you from dying, which is a, a stupid claim that medicine makes. They're not, they're not, they're not going to do that. There's all sorts of reasons why it's not going to happen. And even though more and more of us are living up to the 100 years, the, the total lifespan hasn't changed at all. The, the, the really people that live a long time now don't live any longer than the earlier ones, just that more of us make it. Um, so we're still, we're still all playing that game. Uh, if I can put off death, let me do it. If I could really put it off, I'd, be go, I'd go for it, you know. But I still think we're we're all in that, and I think our current behavior today is a signal of the kind of thing that I was making the argument for. Thank you. We have the book I read, and the author who I I cannot cite. I'm sorry, the book was stolen, and I didn't read it two or three times to fully understand it. But her contention was that denial is not a learned behavior that it goes way back and what actually helped us evolve with the larger brain and that we have the ability to deny death even though we know we're going to deny because if we didn't deny it we would worry about it every day and we don't <laughs> and so it was very very interesting and in how she um related that to genetic i would have to go back and read it several more times. But the point is, is that it's way back in our evolution and not a little behavior. Well, thank you for the question. But I think a lot of other organisms who have actually no concept of death fight to stay alive. You know, that's, this is a universe. This isn't something that we invented. Uh, and you don't have to have any comprehension of what death is. Uh, to see organisms threatened by by predators and engage in all sorts of stuff. So uh, fighting to stay alive goes way, way, way back in the evolution of life. 
and we just picked up uh, the same thing and we we get more sophisticated about it and we got the ability to do something about it i mean you can watch these wonderful pictures of baboon is chased by a leopard and gets to the final point where it turns around and there's a scream and everything and then the final clump comes you know this this baboon is fighting until the last minute to stay alive and it's not surprising uh that that's how it works because uh you got to be alive to reproduce uh, and so the, the the currency of evolution is genes uh, and the currency is not staying alive longer, but uh, there is a relationship because you can't pass any genes if you're dead. And so uh, it, the, the currency leads to a, a fighting to stay alive. And this goes way back. We didn't invent that. We just got more creative about it. Uh, yes, you started with um, natural selection, but you didn't show how religion makes us any more select. Um, and I guess the question is, are we, are we past, are we past the, the uh, process of natural selection now that the brain is in charge? That, that uh, uh, you know, we, when we think about, oh, how are we going to evolve? We talk about planning evolution. No, that's, that sounds like eugenics and we don't do that anymore. Uh, what's going on here? Is natural selection obsolete? No, oh, natural selection is alive and well, and not only in other organisms, but in us. There is there is strong <clears throat> there is strong selection uh, if uh, for lactose tolerance. Uh, there's strong selection for tolerance to antibiotics that kill you. Different stuff is killing us now, and the basis of some of it is genetic, partly genetic, and so natural selection is happening all the time, and. Part of the problem, though, is that natural selection is too slow. We evolved in East Africa in this, and we're, our brain, our Pleistocene brain, is really good at short-term uh, local stuff. That's what, our, that's what our brains evolved to solve. We knew, we knew the local stuff. We didn't know what happened two valleys away, but it's not at all clear would have done us any good to know that. Uh, we're very good at short-term and local stuff. What are the big problems we face today? Big scale, long term. And we don't do well with that. I mean, you get a, a grizzly mauls a, a hiker in, in, in Glacier Park or something. And it's all over the news and everything worries about it. During that time that this has been in the news, 20,000 people die on the highway and nobody cares, you know? So we just, we're just not, we don't do well with uh, and natural selection isn't going to bail us out because that's going to happen too slowly. It's happening and, and, and it's, it's going on and we're not immune to natural selection. It's just rather different uh, now than what's, what, the, what enables us to do better or worse. But uh, the, the big problem is that not that natural selection is dead, but for what we really need, it's too slow. And we're going to have to deal with it somehow with, with our Pleistocene brain that uh, worries more about a cougar death than fifty thousand deaths on the highway, and I'm 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 kind of pessimistic about this. That how we can make our and you, you can see it now with with global warming. There's a real real problem coming fast, and we're not doing anything about it, and we're not going to do anything. We're going to run the experiment. Uh, we're going to see what it's like, and it's not going to be nice, but. I just don't see any chance that we're going to do anything about it. And our brains, unfortunately, our brains don't work that way. But evolution has not stopped. Natural selection is still working. But it's not going to bail us out on the stuff we really care about. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think I think global warming has a, a sense of death denial. I mean, there's part of our population that chooses to deny global warming because it's easier then taking action and trying to um, realize the enormous aspect of the problem. But let's go to question number two from the Friendly House. Um, I'm, I, had, I had two questions, actually. One was, you mentioned that the uh, cooking, the invention of cooking, allowed for uh, supporting the larger brain. 
but yet it would seem like the larger brain was involved in the invention of cooking. And so there's a bit of a chicken and egg argument there. And I'm wondering if the anthropological record uh, mm -hmm. supports uh, uh, a, a more gradual increase in brain size after cooking was invented, perhaps at an earlier stage in human development. And so that, that's my first question is what does the anthropological record say about the juxtaposition of cooking versus uh, brain size increase? Uh, the chicken and egg problem is a real one because these things are going on to some degree simultaneously. I mean, our grain didn't suddenly, it, it was really rapid, but it didn't suddenly, you know, it took uh, centuries of, of thousands of years to, to triple in size. And so, uh, but cooking probably went pretty fast. My guess is that that went really fast. And what my, my guess is what happened is that there were fires all over there and we, our ancestors foraged after the fire uh, and you, as a lot of birds and mammals do because there's a lot of interesting stuff at the edge. And you discovered burnt meat and you discovered how good it was. And so, and chimpanzees like cooked meat, by the way. They, they much prefer cooked meat too. But so I think the discovery of fire or the what fire was doing and how to control it probably went pretty fast. I see no reason to think that that was slow, but then um, the consequences, and I don't think we, obviously, how big a brain did we need to figure out cooking? I don't know, uh, but obviously didn't we, we didn't need the full blown one. Uh, and I don't think there is a historical record that allows us to time that really precisely, but you pose a very interesting question. Uh, a chicken and egg kind of problem. I would simply, in closing, point out that to to make a viable uh, uh, egg, it takes two chickens. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and and my 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 second question was whether, and, and I guess I consider it sort of a, a, an opposing uh, argument of the evolution of religion, and that is that that when cooking was invented, and we started to our group size started to increase so that we started to have larger social groups that could live, that religion came about more as a matter of social control, that it was necessary to bring together, especially in a tribal environment, groups of people who would be willing to fight for their beliefs versus the tribe over the hill, should it happen to come and get yeah. there. So that, that that it may have evolved initially as a more protective uh, uh, and, and a social stabilizing force than necessarily just the fear of death. Yeah, I think uh, I've somewhat oversimplified it uh, to sort of paint a picture, but yeah, other things were going on. What um, also view history um, human history as the increasing ability to kill at ever greater distances. Um, and now I can press a button and kill somebody 10,000 miles away. Uh, but uh, we lived in a, a pretty rough, there were warfare going on all the time of tribals and stuff like that. And grouping together uh, was absolutely essential for that. And uh, I think development of some sort of religious belief that, and we still have it, you know, God's on our side. Uh, and in the Civil War, you know, there's a, the, the Southerners came with the Bibles. The Bible endorses slavery. They're right. There's, there's no anti-slavery thing anywhere in the Bible. Um, in fact, the, the Apostle Paul wrote, this is how slaves should behave to their masters. The Bible thinks slavery is a perfectly good thing. And of course, Every society in the world that time had slavery. Uh, and when uh, a lot of the slaves, all the African societies, if they had a market in slaves, they could deliver them to the, there's all sorts of stuff, it's kind of messy going on. But I, I think group cohesion was very important. And religion still plays a real role in that today. You know, the battle hymn of the Republic, you know, uh, and God is always on every side. And it, it, it makes you feel good. So that this is something also in, involved there with, uh, if you have a, a belief in, in some, somebody who's really in charge out there, 
if you can engage, as I say, you can cut deals. And what the battle hymn of the Republic is cutting deals, uh, and, and all of this stuff with the, the chaplains and everything else. So uh, we, we uh, used, used the concept of, of, of a God up there that is running stuff. Uh, and we still do to cut deals. I mean, Allah cuts all kinds of deals, you know. So this is this is complicated. Uh, we're, we're not, I, mean, I painted a picture of us as kind of doing one thing. Well, that ain't, I mean, I oversimplified, and I apologize for that. The kind of the complex picture you wouldn't have wanted to hear. Okay, but you know, but <laughs> yeah, you, you know, uh, but you know, it's. Um, I think we can still pull out some themes, but religion still. Uh, if we got, if we think God's on our side, we we fight harder. You know, it it has an effect. You know, this so. next question from our Zoom audience re relates a bit to that. It's from Kathy Humble. She writes, "If I'm a Muslim and believe Allah makes everything happen, don't you lose a sense of your own agency and stop paying attention to where that rabbit might hide?" It's an interesting question. Uh, well. My first answer would be no. You still got to get dinner, okay? So you, you got to know if you're going to go out and get dinner, uh, uh, you're going to get some help. And uh, Allah, Allah may tell you where to hunt rabbits, but I think the intentional stand probably worked better because um, what would Allah going to tell you with uh, how much knowledge that Allah have about uh, rabbits? I don't know, but um, the. When you have a strong uh, religious figure that is in charge, well, then you can you can um, pass all your support to that. You can really say, uh, and we can see this with both Christians and Muslims. Now we're not worried about it because God's not going to let this happen. You, you see that that uh, God's in charge, and uh, and for the Christian right in this country, that's one of the reasons for not believing. In global warming, don't worry, God won't let it happen. Um, but you know, I look at the uh, the historical record, and uh, God hasn't batted very well on this stuff. But uh, but nonetheless, the the belief is there. But uh, the religion, the religious beliefs, has an important way of of organizing how you think. And um, um, I think. The conservative Muslim and the conservative Christians are very much the same in this. They, they they use slightly different words, but it's pretty much the same thing as far as I can tell. I don't know if I answered the question well. If not, hit me again. <laughs> <laughs> no. Kathy, I'll think about that. And uh, for right now, let's go to question number three at the Friendly House. Okay, I, uh, I learned in an anthropology class that... Uh, one of the original reasons why the brain got bigger, <clears throat> excuse me, humans as differed from the other primates are hairless, basically. They don't, they have the, don't have the body covered with hair, which allows them to perspire, which gives them greater, uh, uh, they can last longer chasing down their, their game. So, so they were able to chase down the meat which the other primates couldn't do as well. Yeah. Which uh, and meat has so much more protein than vegetables. Yeah. And uh, this is one of the reasons that made the brain brain grow like that. For instance, uh, chimpanzees, uh, you can get enough protein out of vegetables if you eat them twenty four hours a day. Yeah. You know that's the big difference. So I want to hear what you think of that. I think you're ab absolutely correct. One of the most stunning videos I saw, and I think it's still available to see. It's a bunch of Bushmen chasing down a giraffe. Um, and they just followed it, kept it moving. And we can unload heat. We can really unload heat. Uh, the whole body, we can unload heat. The giraffe has to stick its tongue out, as all other mammals basically do. Your dog wants to cool down, out comes the tongue because you can evaporate. You can't evaporate through the, all that body fur. And they watch this and they, they keep chasing this giraffe and finally the giraffe collapses. It can't, can't, 
can't go anymore and they kill it. Um, and so I think the loss of um, fur in our ancestors was very important in this uh, um, ab ability to, to to chase down stuff. Because we can operate, Houdini would go into the oven and come out. Well, you can last in the oven while the meat cooks and you could come out. There's nothing fancy about that he had to do. You can do that. You and I can do that. Uh, so we're, we're tremendous at unloading heat and we can unload heat over the uh, the whole body surface and I've even increased it a little bit where I can unload. <laughs> so no, I think that's, that's a, a very, in, I think you're absolutely right. That's a very important sub theme in, in our evolution when we came down out of the trees and under the savanna. Uh, the loss of the loss of fur and the ability to unload heat better than anybody else. Let's go to a question from our Zoom audience from one of our newer and younger members, Dakota. Dakota, come on in. Um, my question, I was, uh, we don't have any example of an alternative, but would you say that our um, our evolutionary path that we've taken has more to do with us existing as thinking things as like this would have been the path of anything that can think at all or with us simply as primates or as members of this specific species and we don't have like i said any example of those two things being separate of things coming to those sorts of conclusions but do you believe that that's um simply the rational thing that we fought the rational path that we followed well all all primates think you know uh, we didn't invent thinking. Uh, we don't know how they think. We could, uh, one of the things that's close to us is what the emotions are of other animals. We don't really know because uh, we can do all sorts of things. Say with bird song, we can uh, give hormones, play stuff. We can learn all sorts of stuff. But there's no way you can ask the bird, "How do you feel?" You know that, that the emotions that of other animals are are close to us. So, but that doesn't mean they don't have emotions that are just, if we put emotions onto them, we're on our own because we really don't know. The bird maybe we think it's joyous and it could be, geez, I hope I find a mate before the predator gets me, you know, I'm anthropomorphizing, but we have no idea what a bird's feeling and we have no idea what uh, these other so when it comes to other uh, others think they have emotions, but one of the things that we have to understand is that we really don't know what they are, and we haven't figured out. Maybe we'll figure out someday how to answer that. But it's something that's close to us now. What are the emotional lives of of others? But uh, so chimpanzees think chimpanzees have emotions. They they care about stuff, but. I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know what they're feeling because uh, I have no way to ask them in a way that they can tell me. So I don't know if this is a good answer to your question, but um, I think we we need to be very humble as to what we know about something else. Uh, there's real limits on what we can know. Uh, and, and we constantly want to ascribe them. Ah, oh, that bird is having a great time singing there. And oh, I don't know. I really don't know. And I can't know. I don't. I don't know how to ask it. So uh, come back at me again if I didn't. I may not. I may have diverted from what you really asked. Let's go to question number four at the friendly house. Okay, um, I have a jumble of questions in my mind. I'll try to make something coherent out of this. Uh, uh, one of the things I've observed is that uh, I look around and the, everybody seems kind of dumb except me. And, uh, <laughs> and I have that uh, feeling and, too. <laughs> and, uh, I'm interested in mathematics and so on, and the odds are that I'm probably dumb too, uh, but though I, I don't see it. And um, uh, I don't think we can compete against a, a group of people that they're smarter than we are because uh, I don't think we can know. I, I mean, like, uh, I know a lot of mathematics, but I know a lot of mathematicians that know that are pretty stupid about other things. And uh, same thing, there's, I, I, I'm sure there must be something out there that I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, and the church, um, 
gives people a way to form a group and and uh, and approach problems that way. Maybe there's some uh, some good in that. Um, I, you know, I, I think things are hopeless, but I think that a group's possible to solve a problem if we could get the right group. So I, I think uh, I think if I could maybe paraphrase, um, are you asking is group intelligence more powerful and better than in, uh, individual intelligence? Is that what you're I'm, asking? I'm a, I guess I'm asking is that that's the way out. Maybe they maybe there are people out there that are going to pull pull it off. Well. Group intelligence did not invent calculus, but although Newton was in, was influenced by by a lot of stuff, so in the creativity still is fundamentally an individual thing that happens. It may be enhanced and supported and developed with a group, and um, we certainly gain advantages but by being able to work as groups because if we can work together as a group we can defeat somebody who can't get together as a group you know either we hang together or we're going to hang separately kind of idea so the the, the developing of, of an ability ability to work and that is something that it has been enhanced by natural selection we know a lot now uh, we've got evolutionary psychology developing a pretty rich literature why uh you develop uh, these various constraints and, and beliefs and love and hate and all that stuff as to why any any social animal has to develop that. And we know a lot about baboon economics and, you know, that any um, social organization, you know, de develops these, these sorts of things because th there's still a lot of stuff that... Uh, De developing, you know, a, a group thing is is, is important, and and um, and that's that's one of the things that religion does really does well for you because you 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 got this super intelligence that's working for you, and that helps, and that's that's the power the power of religion. But um, creativity, you know, groups don't write Beethoven symphonies, you know. I mean that's it, it, it takes a Beethoven, but Beethoven doesn't exist in a vacuum. Beethoven listened to other people's music and learned a lot. So uh, it was em em embraced in a culture that enabled him to do that. But uh, you still needed the Beethoven. Uh, you needed the Bach with, without, without this individual creativity. And so what you really need in a good society is that which will support and, and enable individual creativity to flower, and that's what that's what uh, a, a society really needs to do. But we're never going to get rid of individual creativity. Group groups don't invent calculus. Groups, groups don't invite write symphonies. <laughs> groups don't invent natural selection. You know, I mean, these these come from individual minds. But as we see, uh, what what can happen uh, is that. Without the group support, those minds don't develop. And we can look at the history. Where did this stuff come? Um, and you know, why why is it that in 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 uh, Western Europe something happened that nothing happened anywhere else? You know, so that's what a lot of political scientists and sociologists study is the, how groups can facilitate the, um, the the flowering of creative individuals, but. Um, it's it's going to always be an interplay between the two, um, and you see, you know what happened in Italy since Puccini, Italy had an opera composer. Something's happened. <laughs> Where are all the operas being composed now? In the states, we're the flowering of opera. <laughs> Crazy, and uh, Puccini was the end in Italy. You know, all of a sudden stopped. Something happened to me. You know, I don't know why, but. but there's this constant interplay, which is really the, the, the guts of what happens. Yeah, uh, yeah my, I was thinking about this whole issue of intentionality and it's ascribing an intentionality to, to the physical world. And it seemed to me that one reason why we like to ascribe intentionality is because if, 
what we want is for the world to be predictable. Yeah. And if we can't control it, which obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but to a large extent before science, we really had no idea of how to control anything. Whereas obviously if we ascribe intentionality, then as you say, we have the opportunity of, of cutting deals. And so to me, it almost seems like religion may have developed to some extent with a fear of chaos. Yeah, we, we hate uncertainty and for good reason. I mean, you wanna, I'm trying to live in a complex world and I would like to have some knowledge of kind of what's coming and understanding of patterns. And I don't wanna be something hitting me out of left field. So we all are searching for, for uh, certainty or understanding. And um, that's what drives religion. That's what drives science. That drives so much of what we try to do. Um, but, um, None of us likes uncertainty. And one of the hardest things for people to say is, I don't know. It's the most important answer you can give to a question. That's the beginning of creativity. What I do as a scientist is if I if I answered I don't know, then there's something to do. <laughs> That's what drives science. I don't know. Uh, but we, we don't want to say, I don't know. And we want the answers. And that's what has drives so much of what we're talking about. And what the, the great advantage of religion has provided all the answers. You want to go to the answers? We got them. We got them. Um, and that, that's very comforting because we all like certainty. There's nothing strange about that. We all want to know. And it's great when, uh, and that's one of the, the the unfortunate things about science, it doesn't provide as much certainty because the scientists are always having to say, I don't know. Nobody likes to hear that. The uh, So you've given us this evolution of religion from nothing to where it is now. Um, where would we go from here? That is, do you see I've, I've watched a number of like conferences and stuff that have kind of looked at whether or not there can be a very naturalistic and scientific uh, form of religion that now starts evolving and and maybe fulfilling the needs that these other religions have fulfilled up to now. Uh, I don't know if that's where it's going to go or somewhere else. Do you have an idea on that? Well, my crystal ball is not any better than yours uh, or be better than anybody else's. I don't know where we're going. I'm scared. I'm, I'm deeply worried about where we're going. Uh, vague, re very vague religion, like, you know, God just speaks to me and, and, and uh, it, it guides me. And I, that's, I can't contest that. If that's what you, know, you believe, and you tell me that's what ha I have to accept it because you're the expert on what you believe. Uh, but it's when uh, the belief then gets involved in the violation of laws of physics and chemistry, as it always does, that be becomes a problem. So I, do I don't, I mean, in, in a sense, I've described to you, you could say it was my religion, but, but uh, I, if, I ask, if you ask me what do I think of religion, that is is a belief system that depends upon uh, the, the 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 use of non scientific concepts that are anti scientific or at least can't be tested scientifically. Although an awful lot of religious beliefs can be tested scientifically, does God answer prayer? That's a testable idea. It has been tested with a double blind in experiments, and the answer is no. Uh, but then it changed anybody's belief. But there was a there was a double blind experiment that uh, uh, a bunch of people, and they all had the same, and they would put divided. I forget what the malady was right now, but they were put into three groups: those that weren't prayed for, those that were prayed for but they didn't know it, and those that were prayed for and they knew it, and recovery. And the answer is pretty flat. The one the group that maybe did slightly poorer 
with the group that was being prayed for and they knew it. And the psychology is, uh, God, if it's that bad, it must be really terrible <laughs> to have all these people out there praying for me. But, uh, but you know, there's been an empirical test. Um, and um, whatever, I mean, I find a lot of comfort in what, the, the kind of worldview I've given. I, I'm very happy with it. Uh, I'm very happy that I don't know. And I've made peace with DNA copying errors is it. And even though that's really weird, <laughs> I okay, I'll, I'll go with it because it seems to be what it is. Um, and, and actually, I like it better than the, somebody's up there pulling strings, uh, which um, I, I find, a, a, you know, like the people, 9-11 and, oh, I was supposed to get the, my, the bus and I'm in and, and God was looking out for me and so I didn't get there. Okay, maybe, but if you believe that, you will believe that he could have saved everybody else too. Uh, and you can't have it both ways. Um, and um, are you really willing to say that he saved you, but he could have saved everybody else and didn't? So the problem with some of these beliefs is they put you into a belief system that is just full of contradictions. And whatever I think we need in the future is, and one that I'm trying to develop for myself is one that doesn't have those kind of contradictions. It doesn't place me in a special spot that uh, the world is, is responding to me in a way different than it responds to anybody else. I find real comfort in that. Um, what, what people will come up with, I mean, uh, people have come up with a mega point and all sorts of stuff that uh, when I look at it, I find somehow it doesn't compute for me, but uh, I don't know what's going to come up. My, my crystal ball is no better than anybody else's. Um, what we might come up with, I don't know. Um, but meanwhile, I'm glad that there are wonderful secular humanist groups that we can have this kind of discussion. This meeting is going to have a nice evolutionary symmetry to it, as we had Ann Henderson begin the meeting with a very thoughtful reading. She's going to end the Q&A with what I'm sure is an equally thoughtful question. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. Um, uh, actually, Johnny, when Johnny mentioned the business about hair, hairlessness, do, do you think that uh, because of the evolution of the cooking and the fire, that that's what made us hairless. It made us what? Hairless. That we that we got that we got rid of our hair because we were warm enough with the fire. No, I don't think that's because you don't think that's the case. Well, no. you could only yeah, sit around the fire at night. Uh -huh. The fire didn't do you any good during the day or anywhere else, and you had to be real close to it. And it was even good if you got into a cave and put it at the entrance, but uh, fire doesn't help you very far away from it. You know, it, uh, the power decreases exponentially as you go away from a fire. So I don't think Then that... what do you think did? What? Then what did well, make us hairless? We, 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 we became ground inhabiting and we're out on the savannah and where it's hot um, out there during the day. And what the advantage is that we got that we could operate during the day when nobody else could. Lions can't hunt during the day, it's too hot. You know, and when they have trouble with both, and they do have to try to hunt during the day, it's really hard you know, for them. So uh, what losing the hair enabled us to hunt and uh, operate in the savannah during the heat of the day when uh, otherwise only mad dogs and Englishmen are out. So it was natural selection so, that natural made us selection more, caused us to drop our to fur. Drop our fur. Uh, <laughs> and um, but I, I don't think it had anything to do with the fire because yeah. that's that's so local. Uh, you, you got dinner and you were warm if you were within ten feet of it, but that's about it. Dr. Orians, this was an outstanding presentation today. You gave us a lot to think about and gave us incredible knowledge today. And the Q and A was really outstanding today, everybody.